Okay, so what we're going to look at today is advertising. We've been looking at um, where our claims come from, what our information sources are, and what, to what degree we can trust them, what degree they have credibility. And you'll remember that a couple lectures ago when I talked about um, all the different types of information sources we had. Um, you know, your personal experience, your background knowledge, which you can usually trust, although it could be wrong occasionally. We had um, the media. We had Kevin Dilley come in and talk about the media. Uh, we talked about experts last time. Now we're going to look at advertising. Why are we going to look at that? Why does the book actually give it its own section? Well, two reasons. One is advertising is somewhat different in its nature than any of these other information sources. Here's why. Anytime somebody's putting out an advertisement, they're an interested party. Anytime. You know, it could be that your doctor is an interested party if he advises you to get an operation because uh, he needs to pay the bills, right? Um, but usually your doctor is fairly disinterested. The media is supposed to be disinterested. Uh, and as Kevin Dilley pointed out, if they, if they lack the impression, at least, of being disinterested, they lose credibility. With advertisements, only fools ex expect advertisements to be fair, honest, or disinterested. But a lot of people actually get sucked into that. Um, the other reason why your book focuses on it is advertisements actually do work. <coughs> They are one of the biggest failures of critical thinking, and they usually hit you in your, what, in your pocketbook. Right? So people buy things because they uh, are sort of psychologically tricked into it, uh, or, or led, you know, willingly down the path. Um, and some of the things that we're going to study, we're going to actually just look at ads, but a lot of this is applied psychology, and they do this with a lot of other things, too. There was an interesting story just recently, uh, I forget which paper it was in, and it was sort of an editorial, and it was talking about how, you know, all these schools now are trying to switch to healthy choices. You guys are familiar with this? You know, we should be offering fruit instead of uh, candy bars as dessert, all that sort of stuff. Well, how do you get the kids to actually do that? One way to actually do that is put the fruit in a well-lit place in a bright yellow or orange or red bowl. And that sounds stupid, doesn't it? That shouldn't affect anything. If you do that, then the consumption of fruit goes up like 200%. Why? Well, because we're easily manipulated. There are certain cues. You know, if, it, if it's in a sort of dingy corner, somebody says, hey, I don't want that fruit, it looks kind of nasty. But if it's in a very nice, well-lit place, then it looks very legitimate. I should, yeah, I should have that banana instead of the, the candy bar. They found that if you put ice cream uh, which I guess a lot of schools had ice cream as a dessert. If you put ice cream in a frosted um, glass case, as opposed to a you know a glass case where you can actually see the ice cream, ice cream consumption goes way down. Isn't that silly? But it works. Advertisements work too. So we're going to look at a little bit of uh, what's behind that. Um, but first. I want, to, I want to sort of explore this. So, what do advertisements ultimately try to get us to do? Right. That's, that's one thing. If we use the word buy in a very broad sense. Um, buy. Right. So let's talk about, what do you think when I, when I say buy product? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Probably purchasing. Going to the store and actually setting some money down, giving them your credit card. <clears throat> so, purchasing items. Is that the only way that we buy products from advertising? Think about the other kinds of advertisements that are out there. What else do you have? You can go online. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm thinking instead of the format, whether it's TV, online, or anything like that, I'm thinking about the object of what is it trying to get you to, to buy into? Trying to get you to buy the ideas. Yeah. That's, that's uh, let's see, let's say agree with or 
disagree with. Ideas, or another thing can sometimes be behavior. You know, that, I mean, you've all, all seen all those seatbelt ads, or um, the cigarette ads, the one, you know, they don't have ads for cigarettes on TV, they have anti-smoking ads. Those are designed to get you to, to not do something, and to feel a certain way, you know. That's why they're, they're set up to gross you out, um, or to shock you. What else? These are two main things that it adds to. We create change we want. Yeah, um, and that often fits in with this, but there's another way of creating change. You're on the right track. Emotions. Well, that's, that's a sort of broad technique that they use in all of these. What other ways can you create change in your city, your country? Political. Yes. And political ads, they're not trying to actually get you to buy something. They're not just trying to change your ideas. What are they aimed at? What's that? To vote for a person. To vote for a person. So sometimes they're, they're for a person, sometimes they're just playing against a person, right? Um, and, and I suppose you could have some ads that kind of blur the boundaries, like, you know, go online and vote for Coke instead of Pepsi in the Coke-Pepsi challenge or something like that. That's, that's kind of blurring the line between these two. Or, um, you know, these two can, can blur together pretty easily as well because a candidate stands for certain things. Or at least the ad presents them as standing for certain things, don't they? Um, you know, if, if the candidate is a liberal, um, so-and-so wants to abort all the nation's children. You know, that's saying that they stand for something if they're on the right wing. So and so wants to lock up everybody. Uh, again, you know, false attribution, but they're saying that the person stands for something. Um, so these are three different types of things that the ads try to get us to buy. Buying can be understood in the you know the very strict monetary sense, but it can also be understood as buying into something. You know, when you buy into something, you're changing your ideas about it. We're going to mainly be looking at the purchasing items aspect, but you can also keep these in mind as well. This especially is insidious, because if you think about what's going on with that, that's a little bit different than coming straight out and saying, hey, we want you to buy this. We want you to purchase our, our product because it's making us rich. But it's easy to tell the interest there, isn't it? If, if I'm selling you a product and I say you should buy my product, um, because it's going to, you know, pick whatever you want, make you successful, clear up your acne, um, make your house beautiful. I'm an interested party, and it's it's really easy to tell that I am. If I'm running an ad for or against a candidate, it's pretty easy to tell that I'm an interested party too, isn't it? If I'm running ads and I'm saying I'm not really interested, I'm running public service ads. This is public service. I am trying to help you. I'm just trying to, you know, orient you to, you know, make better decisions. I'm just providing you information. Is that really all that's going on? Um, if it was, they wouldn't be putting the ads on the air. They would, they would just supply you pamphlets or information in other ways. Why do they choose to go on TV or on the internet? Everyone's online. Say again? Everyone's online. We're watching TV. Uh, yeah, you can reach a broader audience. Um, there's something else too, though. When you're watching TV, you're actually much more ready for manipulation than when you're reading, believe it or not. Just physiologically. They've done all these studies, um, and people are much more receptive to that. Just the very format itself, the visual format, things are very short, punchy. They don't allow you a lot of time to think. If you have something in front of you, you can actually read it over several times and think about it. You get bombarded with enough commercials, you may, and if you don't have, you know, if you don't have your mind already made up about something and have a fairly strong will, you may find yourself changing your mind about things, and that's exactly what they want to do. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing necessarily, but that means that they are interested parties. I'm not saying that that anti-smoking ads are bad because they're, you know, telling you lies or anything. They're actually telling you the truth. Smoking is bad for you. 
But, from a critical thinking perspective, they're manipulating it. You know, there's something pokey about it. And you might say, well, you know, you have to fight fire with fire. We're going to look at that later on in the semester. That's a fallacy. Call two wrongs make a right. The yeah. thing with the tobacco ads, the tobacco companies are the ones who pay for them. Oh, yeah, the tobacco companies have been forced to, to pay for, for anti-tobacco ads as part of the cost of doing business. Yeah, um, well, that, that has to do with the sort of political compromise that got worked out. There was such a, you remember this, there was just about 15, 20 years ago, there was such a strong anti-tobacco sentiment, this, this feeling that, you know, the companies have been lying to, to you know, consumers for years and, and you know, causing all this, this, this death and destruction. We've got to make them pay. You, you remember that, right? Um, and that actually, you know, that's, that's affected North Carolina pretty severely. The economy. Yeah, the economy here um, used to be dependent on tobacco. Tobacco, really tobacco and textiles. Yeah, there's been some. Yeah, there's been some divestation, as they call it, from from tobacco farming. In part because there's not as many consumers, right? Um, the big consumers are overseas, um, and. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Sometimes companies are actually forced to take a stand against their own product as the cost of doing business. Now, who's the interested party there? The company is doing it in order to, to, to keep going, right? so they can make profits. But the middleman there is the agencies that are producing the ads, and uh, they're wholly against you know, smoking, the, the people who do those um, uh, truth ads. Some of those are pretty gross. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, now, something I've brought up over the course of the semester, each time that we brought up advertising, is the idea that an advertisement is always an argument, isn't it? So, and it may not actually be explicitly framed as such. But every advertisement, just like any other way to try to motivate people to action, is always an argument. It's what we call practical argumentation. It has to do with um, what you ought to do. So what's the ultimate conclusion of these, these arguments? It's always you should buy X. And then we have some sort of premises, and they're supposed to lead us to, to this. So things like our product is the most superior, um, you're going to love our product, uh, put our, our clothes on and they'll make you look sexy, all those sorts of things are not the ultimate claim of the advertisement. The ultimate claim that they're trying to get you to draw is, hey, I need, I need that. I should go buy that. Everything else in the advertisement is designed to somehow get you to that place. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. That's why your book breaks ads down into several different categories. Um, now, like he, the book points out, um, how do they do this? Advertising firms understand our fears and desires at least as well as we understand them ourselves. Are any of you um, psychology majors, communications majors? Uh, what else might be useful? Well, I mean, if you had a philosophy major, that'd be very useful for that because you learn a lot about human nature that way. Uh, and the dark side would be, you know, going to the dark side would be becoming an advertising person. Um, how do advertising firms actually, you know, pull it off? Well, they hire experts, people who understand motivation. What gets us to like certain things, to dislike certain things. And we're not usually 100% honest with ourselves about what it is that we like and don't like anyway. Um, advertisers, they tap into that. They've been doing this for about 60 years um, in, in a deliberate way, employing psychologists deliberately as experts. There was a book that I, uh, I've got a copy of at home called The Hidden Persuaders. 
and it was one of those expose tell-all books about you know the advertising industry and how they work. And it showed that they were actually using depth psychology, which was one of the, the big um, things at the time, to deliberately set up ads to appeal to our not not just our surface emotions, but our deep desires. That was in the '60s that that book came out. So just think about how sophisticated it is now. Every time an advertisement goes out, unless it's you know just you know mom and pop's carpet store, you know, and, and you don't you notice those ads aren't very persuasive, are they? But the slick, processed ads that you see these days, those have usually passed through several different experts' hands. And, and those experts are, are, you know, filing reports and saying, this is what we want to appeal to. This is why, remember, advertisers, who do they also have to appeal to? They have to appeal to the clients. They have to be able to tell those clients, when you shell out a million dollars for this ad, you're going to actually get some results. And they, and they do get results. So, like he, you know, like he says, um, they employ trained psychologists, some of the world's most creative artists, and they use um, theories about motivation. They also have a lot of money to spend. Um, advertisements are one of the reasons why going into business or going into politics is very expensive. Um, some of the products that you buy especially the, the really high-end things, the product, half the cost of the product may be just advertisement alone. You know, if you're buying luxury items, a lot of that's advertisement. Um, if you want to go into politics, you have to raise money. Why do, you, why do you raise all that money? It's not just to pay staffers, it's primarily to pay for those, those advertisements. And actually, if you accumulate enough money, you can keep your opponents from running. You build up a huge war chest you know, say $50 million, and you say, well, you know, if you run against me, you need to have at least $50 million, because I'm going to spend that much against you. Um, that keeps a lot of people out of politics. So advertising, you know, has a really deep roots in our, our culture, not only commercial, but political. Now, like he says, do we need to understand the deep psychology of an advertisement? Do you have to go and get yourself a, a PhD in, in uh, you know, rhetoric and communication, or philosophy or uh, even media studies in order to see through advertisements. No, you just have to apply some critical thinking. Start out by telling yourself, when you see an ad and you feel tempted, you know, if you like going along with the advertisements, not, not a problem. If you like the stories they tell you, not a problem. I love watching advertisements that are funny myself. Um, but if you're tempted to buy something after watching the ad, you should go through this process. Try to apply the things from your critical thinking class. Start with the conclusion. If it's an ad, it's always got the same conclusion. You should buy this. How do they get there? Here's, here's what you would do. You would reconstruct the how, and then you assess it. You say, now that I see that, does that actually provide me good reasons for buying that product? And 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, the answer is, right? No. Yeah. Um, the, only, the only time an advertisement could actually be making a uh, solid argument is when it's a very boring advertisement. And if you look at the history of advertisements when they first came out, have any of you ever seen those old um, magazines, you know, like National Geographic, you go back in the library and look at them from the 30s and 20s and all that, and you see some of the advertisements in there, some of them are already pretty slick. But some of them are just straight out, you know, um, steel bench, good for working on, uh, cost this much. That's an advertisement. And they're trying to say, well, you know, if, if, you, if you need this, you should buy it, and here's its specifications. That could actually be a good argument. Every other advertisement that you look at is going to be a bad argument somewhere along the line. So with that said, Let's look then at um, how the book divides these up. And the book says there's basically two kinds of ads. Let me erase this. Okay, so two main 
times of x. One is adds that divide reasons for you to buy the product. Vote for John McCain because he is going to do this, this, or this. Vote for Barack Obama because he's going to do this, this, or this. Vote against John McCain because he's going to do this, this, or this. Vote against Barack Obama because he's going to do this, this, or this. Um, within about a year, you guys are going to start seeing a lot of political ads running. Um, not just among the Republicans who have to figure out who they're going to run against Barack Obama, but you're also going to see a lot of Democratic ads for Barack Obama even before um, you know, the real race is, is going on, before the Republicans have picked a candidate. The, the Democrats are actually going to be running the ads. This happens, I'm not just picking on the Democrats here. The Republicans do this when um, they're the ones in power. They're going to be running ads trying to mess with the other party, trying to get you know, people to vote for the weaker candidates, or trying to uh, weaken the stronger candidates. Um, they're going to be giving reasons. You should, you should vote this way because of this. Um, a lot of advertisements that you see um, on TV for products, <clears throat> they give you reasons why you should buy that product. You know, um, think of uh, what is that acne medication you see constantly coming up? Proactive. Proactive, yeah. Jessica Simpson used it. And um, that's going to get into a, a different thing. But what do they do? They show you, well, before and after. And uh, if you buy Proactive, this could be you. That is actually giving you reasons. Those reasons are the premises in your argument. They may not be good reasons. Um, you know, will, well, let's think about the proactive commercials. Or any, really any commercial where they show you before and after in one case or two cases. Um, is that enough to generalize on, to have a strong inductive conclusion that this probably is going to work for me? I, I should buy this? I see some heads shaking. Yeah, and we do get suckered into it. Why? Because we love examples. We love to think, yeah, I'm probably like that person. That's probably just like my case. Uh, and a lot of people buy things that work for one or two people. I'm not, I'm not knocking proactive. Apparently that, that product actually does work fairly well, from what I can tell. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know I, I, don't, I don't have acne, so I don't worry about that. Um, I remember when I, was, when I was in high school, it's kind of funny, these things are so relative. When I was in high school, I had really good skin. And so if I got one pimple, it was like the whole world was over. Because, I, you know, you know, you know how self-conscious you are in high school. Everybody's going to be looking at me. And you just got that one, yeah, there, I had other blemishes, but you have that one blemish. And that's going to undo everything. And then you don't want to go to school. And you're worried, and you know, you pull your hair down to get, you know, cover it up, or whatever you can do. And then here would be like, you know, some kid sitting next to me, you know, the poor guy, just covered in, you know, and he wasn't bothered at all because he was used to, you know, day in, day out being stuck with that. Um, a lot of our problems are that way, you know. Some of the things that we that we're really, really bothered by, they're the end of the world for us, are kind of small potatoes when you put them next to somebody else, aren't they? Okay, so ads that provide reasons. Then we have what would be the opposite? Ads that don't provide. And what we need to read here, they don't provide explicit reasons why we should buy the product. Instead, they do something else. Does that mean they're not providing us any reasons at all? Think back to implicit premises. Right? A lot of arguments, they're requiring you to assume something or to you know, connect the dots. These ads are still expecting you to do that. And there's a couple different techniques that they, they use. These aren't all the advertising techniques. If you're really interested in this, we have a lot of books in the library covering this. Um, and you could, you could talk about this, um, I mean, you could talk about it with me in office hours, but you could also talk with some of the communications professors or some of the business professors, the marketing professors, and they could tell you all about different techniques that you can use for advertising. Your book breaks it down into three categories. 
Um, ads that bring out feelings. being used or endorsed by people we admire or think of ourselves as being like, and I'm going to uh, use a term for that that we often use, ads that rely on what we call identification. And then ads that um, depict the product being used in situations in which we would like to find ourselves. Or, and I would also include in that uh, situation we wouldn't like to find ourselves. So, he adds that depict good or bad situations. Um, now, what are some examples of, of these? Well, think about your range of feelings. Later on in the semester, we're going to spend um, some time just talking about feelings. Not, not in the sense that I'm going to say, you know, Mr. Solis, how do you feel today? Or anything like that, right? But in the sense that we're going to look at how our feelings affect our, our critical thinking. And whether they can take it off the rails sometimes. Um, which they do. Sometimes our feelings... Um, I don't know why my clock went off. There we go. Sometimes our feelings, we think they give us good reasons to act or to, to think a certain way, but quite often they, they can be misleading. Think about anger. Anger is not used quite so often in advertisements. But think about how anger leads you off track in, in real life, in day-to-day -day life. Once you become angry, it's really easy to come up with all sorts of reasons why you should stay angry, why you should take revenge on that person, why uh, everybody else who's connected to that person is a jerk, you know, are these really good reasons? Not usually. Um, what kind of emotions do advertisements appeal to, you think? Happy. Happiness, yeah. That's, that's uh, very good. They, a lot of ads want to make you feel kind of warm and fuzzy about the product. And the idea is they show you some, some nice scenes, maybe a family together, and then you'll associate the product with that. A lot of them use humor. Why do they use humor, do you think? How do you feel when you're laughing? Yeah, happy in a, in a somewhat different sense. It's not the sort of contentment that comes with just hanging out. It's like a rush, though. You're right. That's a good way to put it. There's a certain rush that comes with laughter. Laughter is, is one of those, some psychologists call it a borderline uh, phenomenon, meaning that it's, it's, it's a state that's kind of fluctuating, and it's, it's actually kind of difficult to figure out exactly what's going on when we're amused, you know, why we find certain things funny. You Sometimes ever try to be funny, and then the next second you're like ticked off or something. I mean, yeah, and, and, and you know, sometimes the same joke, really funny the first time, doesn't have quite as big of a payoff the next time. Um, although there are certain ones that will always remain. Um, Workable, a lot of physical. Humor. Okay, so the camera went out. Um, where was it? With pity, right? We're talking about pity. Um, these advertisements try to appeal to our, our sense of pity um, in order to get us to, to spend money. If they make us too sad, they don't work, though. Then we don't want to do anything. Um, some ads actually do try to appeal to anger. A lot of political ads, you know. You get angry at John McCain, therefore you should vote for Barack Obama. You get angry at Barack Obama, you should vote for whoever they are against him. Um, actually, the John McCain ads, the anti-John McCain ads were actually trying to direct people's anger against George Bush and then say, John McCain is like George Bush, so therefore vote for Barack Obama. Um, all political ads are wasted. All political ads are wasted. They, they work. They're very effective. Um, they sometimes decide... But they never deal with the real issues, so. Oh, yeah, okay, that's a good point. So those are two different uh, questions. Do they, are they effective? Yes, yeah. they're effective. Are they effective in actually setting out the real issues and communicating about them? They're actually effective in obscuring them. That's, that's, that's one of the problems with them. Let's uh, look at ads that rely on identification. These are where you have a celebrity endorsement. 
So, you know, sometimes the celebrity might actually be an expert on something. When we were talking about um, uh, uh, people who seem to be experts but aren't really experts, a lot of celebrity endorsements of products, they're not experts on that product. But if Michael Jordan actually does endorse Nike footwear, that guy's done a lot of running in his life, hasn't he? A lot of jumping. So, plausibly, he might actually have something to say about that. When he endorses Hanes underwear, is he an expert on underwear? No more than me. No more than you, right? Yeah, we all wear underwear, I hope. <laughs> um, unless it's a special occasion of some sort or you're at the beach. Um, so, you know, celebrity endorsements. What's going on? Why do they put these celebrities in there? Well, because people like celebrities. We identify with them. One of the, the ads that I actually have in this pool for you is that, that classic um, McDonald's ad that has two sports icons, two basketball icons. Um, this is Michael Jordan as a young man. Now he's an old man, right? Uh, and Larry Bird as a middle-aged man. He's now a very old man. Basketball standards, right? And they are, they're playing against each other for the big man. The winner gets to eat the Big Mac. Are you guys familiar with this commercial? I do have it in Blackboard for you. It's the one they're shooting shots and they get wilder and wilder and pretty soon they're on top of the Sears Tower and they're going to uh, do some, some crazy shot. Well, why did they put those guys in there? They were both well-liked basketball guys. And if you think about the way that ad was set up, you want to appeal to as many people as possible. That ad set up to appeal to men, not, not so much to women. But think about who they captured. You got a black man and a white man. You've got a young man and an old man. They're covering it all. Yeah, they're, they're, they're getting as many in there as they, they can. It was a very smart ad. They have a new ad out, apparently, it's about a year old, where two other guys are, I forget who, they're, they're some of the big players now. They're playing against each other, doing the same sort of thing. And what happens, Larry Bird comes along and steals their sandwich. Have you guys seen that one too? It's out there. Uh, just take a look at that. Sometimes, it, so sometimes it's ads that have celebrities that we, we like, we identify with. Sometimes it just has you know um, um, somebody who's liked us and um, we can identify with as well. Um, then this is kind of similar. These overlap a little bit. There are ads that depict situations. Um, you don't want this to happen to you. Think about those ADT commercials. What do you see in those? Breaking. Exactly, breaking. And, and is it done in a sort of you know matter of fact way? Well, there's some dramatic music, right? They get scared. They run to the phone. ADT is there for them. Don't worry, ma'am. Help is on the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, those are very dramatic. Oh, yeah, the the, yeah, some you know when those first came out, I found those actually um, upsetting. You know, remember the one where the kids are talking and they're just driving along, and then suddenly they get they get um, blindsided, and there's glass everywhere. That was kind of shocking, wasn't it? Um, and what's the message there? Well. You really want to have OnStar in a situation like that, don't you? Because otherwise you might die. Uh, now, they're not all, you know, bad situations. I actually have a, a great ad in there. Uh, some of you may have seen this commercial. It's a condom ad. Have you guys seen the Zazu condom ad? It's, uh, it's this guy, and he looks like he's, you know, um, early 30s maybe. And he's in the supermarket with his kid, and his kid is just totally misbehaving. Have you guys, does this ring a bell? He's like pulling things off the shelf and doing tantrum and all that. And then at the very end of the ad, it says Zazu condoms. And what's the idea there? What is, what is their, their point? Well, you know, if you don't want to have brat kids like that, and not all kids are brats, right? We know that. If you don't have brat kids like that, then buy our product. It's depicting a situation you don't want to be in. Then there's a lot of ads that are depicting situations you do want to be in. You know, if you buy our product, this will be you. And it's not a celebrity. Um, two ads along those lines that are kind of funny. One of them I have in there. Um, 
All these Viagra ads, right? Now, some of the Viagra ads are aimed at men. You know, satisfy your partner. You know, be a real man again. That sort of thing. Um, the one that I've got in Blackboard for you is from the woman's perspective. And it's a musical. It's all these middle-aged women, and they're singing this good morning, good morning, we talk the whole night through song. Um, and that's code, of course, right? Um, good morning, good morning, they're all you know, cheery, bright, happy, because through the miracle of Viagra, their love life has been rekindled again. Um, now, you know, if you're, if you're in that sort of situation and you see that ad, you know, Viagra might look like a real answer. Think about those enzyme ads. Who's, who's the main character in those that you remember? Enzyme? About male enhancement. The uh, woman. The wife? But who's the, who's the, the guy who's... The husband. Yeah, Smiling Bob. Oh, yeah, yeah. He goes bowling, he does cookouts, all that sort of stuff. There's one, there's, there's a Christmas one where he's Santa Claus. Um, now, what's the idea behind that? Well, again, it, in part it's appealing to fears, right? But it's also, it's geared towards middle-aged men trying to say, if you buy our product, you will be in a much better situation. Most beer ads fit into this, don't they? Most soda ads. You know, Mountain Dew had an entire sort of remake of their, their image um, in the 1980s and on through. Mountain Dew managed to associate itself with a certain lifestyle. Extreme. Extreme sports. Extreme this. Extreme that. So people, you know, jumping off of bridges and then they drink the Dew. So even if you're, you know, kind of overweight and, and not in shape and, um, you know, not given to a lot of outdoor activities, you know, like me, uh, if you drink the dew, or do the dew, then you'll be like these people. Now, clearly, not the case, is it? If you buy the, the beer, will, will your life uh, suddenly become fun and magical? No. Um, so, I, like I said, I put a lot of these ads into Blackboard for you guys to take a look at. And I'd like you to take a look at them uh, when you can over the, the next couple days. Um, and try to see where they fit into this. I, I know I've got them categorized, but some of them may fit more than one category as well. And for the ones that are giving reasons, try to think about what are the reasons they're actually giving. Are they any good? 